Um, so I feel very lucky to have this spot right now. I feel like um, uh, Glenn gave a really great uh, sell for the use of incentives this morning. Kai gave a really perfect overview of the Luna presentation that I fit into. I'm one, one of the many activities in it. And I think Natalie really highlighted the, um, the need to understand the acceptance and social issues around sanitation. Um, so what I'm going to be speaking about today is how we can potentially incentivize sanitation through urine collection. As I mentioned, um, this uh, project fits into the bigger Luna project. So the goal of this is actually twofold. One is to motivate people to accept and potentially come to like the urine diverting toilets that have been installed here in Itaquini municipality. And two, as a second goal, is to supply a um, greater and consistent urine uh, feedstock for the reactor work that Kai was talking about earlier. So these are water. these are the UDVTs that are um, have been installed here, 75,000, you'll see them on Thursday. EWS has taken a lot of time and a lot of effort to um, perfect the design, both in terms of the pedestal, the urinal, the vaults. Um, they've worked a lot with the technology, and they also have worked a lot with the education um, and the awareness campaigns within the communities. Their goal is to become 100% open defecation free. And perhaps more importantly, and this is something that Neil spoke about um, during his keynote presentation, is to remove the stigma that dry sanitation is for poor people. And so when Neil was talking about installing the urine diverting dry toilets into the head office on Prior Road down in the city, this is one of the initiatives that he was talking about. Um, Ultimately, though, if we're going to increase the acceptance of the UDDTs because we know they're not universally accepted and not really taken as the gold standard, people are still looking for that flush option, we need to understand how uh, we can increase the demand for these UDDTs. Um, we also know from this project and from hundreds of other sanitation projects that have been um, performed or conducted in developing countries that education and health messages don't always have the impact that we've hoped for. And we know this about ourselves, we know we should all floss, we don't do it. Um, you know, people can tell us to do certain things and those health messages just don't work. So what we need to do is start thinking about more creative and potentially um, new innovative ways of incentivizing and motivating people to um, get on board with this sort of sanitation technology. And what I'm going to be talking about today are incentives. Ah, Glenn talked about this briefly. But incentives are essentially a cash payment or the use of a product that is given to someone to either incite a behavior to get them to do something for the first time or to maintain that behavior over a long time. They've also been called Conditional cash transfers, one of the most famous examples of conditional cash transfers is called Progresa. Um, it's a Mexican program that has been very successful at getting poor families to not only put their children into school, but keep their children in school. And not only are they paid more for each year that the, children, that the child remains in school, they're paid more for girl children. So if you can get a girl child to graduate high school, you're paid actually quite quite an impressive amount of money. And this has been um, sort of one of the gold standards in, in cash transfers. Vaccinations is another example. Women sometimes are quite hesitant to get their babies vaccinated. The baby gets the shot and it cries for three days. It might get sick. Some women don't want to do that, whereas a small incentive will get them to bring the baby in. And so in that way, you can achieve a greater social benefit with a very small payment to a person. As far as we know, um, these types of incentives have not been used in sanitation. This will probably be one of the first examples. And the hypothesis that we're working on here is that if we can get people to um, accept this incentive, so find the, the right price, um, that people will modify their behavior, and if we can get them to modify their behavior for a long enough period of time, that behavior will just become ingrained, and it will become something that's normal, and we won't have to maintain this incentive over a long period of time. Clicking, and it's not 
There we go. So this research um, has a four-phase approach. The first phase uh, that we conducted was a baseline household survey of about 1,500 households here in the Itaquiti municipality, all at households that have uh, the UDDTs. We asked them a whole battery of socioeconomic questions to get an idea of who they were and what kind of um, lives they were living, basically. We took photos of their toilets to understand the physical conditions, so to see if maybe there were some construction issues or some use issues which might be preventing them or, or um, causing them to not accept the toilet as it is. And we also asked them to take part in a choice experiment. And a choice experiment is basically asking someone to make a choice between two options. So you can see um, these two diagrams, this is just one set, um, that shows a work and a payment combination. So we ask people to make choices between different work payment combinations and which one they would prefer. So whether they would prefer to walk a short distance for a small payment or a long distance for a larger payment, we vary the types of payments and I'll talk about that more in a bit. The second phase um, of the research involved a baseline household survey of the urine that was produced. So we installed urine collection tanks at about 700 households. These urine tanks were then connected to the outlet of the urinal <coughs> and the UDDT so that we could collect all of the urine that was produced at that household. We had a huge team of surveyors, about 18 of them, who went out every other day, so three times a week, and measured the quantity of urine at that household for an entire month. So in this way, we were able to determine quantitatively how much that toilet was being used. And I recognize that when I say used, I'm just referring to urination, but in this context, um, I wasn't prepared to measure feces, so we're taking urine as a proxy measurement um, for toilet use, which is probably conservative, because if you're gonna use it, you might just use it for defecation as opposed to urination. And what we found um, is that the results varied quite dramatically, unfortunately dramatically within a small range, which was a low range. So if we consider that families are anywhere between five and 10 people, um, we weren't getting much more than about two liters per day per family. These are averages from the area. So we did have some much higher outliers, but as an average, the, the quantity was quite low. The third phase is what's going on currently, which is what I'm doing right now here in Durban. And this is where we're actually installing different incentive schemes. We have three areas where we'll be installing three different incentive models. We're gonna let those run for three months, and after three months, we're gonna change the model so that we'll be able to test, in effect, six different incentive models. And finally, after we've run this, we'll be able to go back, ask more household questions, and measure the quantity of the urine that was produced um, in the control areas where the incentives were not offered. And this will just allow us to ensure that the impact of the incentives in the treatment areas was caused by the incentives and not by some seasonal fluctuation or something else. Um, this is each Queen municipality. You can see it's quite big. Um, covers quite a lot of area. These are the three treatment areas where we're going to be, or we actually have, installed the incentives. And these are the three control areas that have urine tanks, but currently this, um, these areas are serviced by the EWS staff. So EWS has a team of urine collectors who goes to these households and empties the urine from their tanks weekly. These people are not given an incentive, so they have no reason to produce more or less urine than they normally would. And this provides the control areas for our incentive treatments. Just to give you a little idea of the range of prices, Natalie spoke about the peak phosphorus. Phosphorus became very much a hot issue a couple of years ago. Um, Kai also pointed out, though, that phosphorus makes up a small percentage of the value of urine. But just to give you an idea here, the um, phosphorus is worth about three rand cents per liter. So not really a huge financial value. Um, whereas the cost for EWS to go and collect the urine from these households in the control areas costs them about 12 rand per liter. So um, they're doing it at a loss, but with the intention of collecting a large volume of urine and with the ultimate goal of increasing toilet use, which we can't actually put 
um, a really hard financial figure on. Uh, minimum wage here in Durban is 19 rand an hour, and if we consider that we can set up a collection point within about 20 minutes walking distance from anyone's house, it would take them about 40 minutes to walk there and back to drop off their urine at a collection point, and in terms of their time converted to money, that would be about 13 rand. So in developing the matrix of incentives, we're looking at three different factors. The first factor is price. Um, we'll be varying that between 0.5 and 1 rand per liter. That works out to between 10 and 20 rand per 20 liter jerry can. So if you're bringing one jerry can that's completely full, you would get 10 rand um, at the first price level. We're also varying the type of incentive, so varying it between cash and product. Product would be a food voucher at a local shop for one of five basic food items. And the delivery method, either you would get that item or cash payment immediately, cash in hand, or it would be delayed depending on how, how much credit you need to accumulate. I also just want to point out that this is the value that would go into the person's hand, the person who's producing the urine. The overall program costs would have to be factored in and would raise these values so we can't compare them directly with the EWS costs that I presented earlier. So from this matrix, uh, we can come up with six different program designs. We're actually going to be testing these six. The first three are running currently. As I mentioned, they're all running at the 0.5 Rand level right now. We're going to increment them up to the 1 Rand per liter after three months. So when someone comes to one of our collection points, this is what it looks like. They'll bring one of the yellow jerry cans that's been installed at their house. Uh, you can see it's been marked with a unique household ID number. This is how we keep track of the house <laughs> and how much they're producing. Um, Bonga Kile is the woman who works at this collection point. So she'll weigh that tank and record the weight. This is how she essentially calculates how much urine is in there and how much volume has been produced. And then what she's doing in the right-hand side is measuring the conductivity. So this is how we control for the quality of the urine and make sure we're not just getting water or some other fake liquid. And I think in this case, honestly, um, it's the fear factor that keeps people honest more than uh, anything else. Just knowing it's being tested seems to have quite a strong impact. And the urine we get is very, very high quality. So this is the collection point. Um, in Cliffdale, these are the two women who work there. They're there um, 9 to 5, waiting for people to deliver their, their urine. You can see the price scale is posted clearly. The acceptance criteria, both in terms of conductivity and pH, and the value of the tokens that they can receive is all very clear so that the interaction is very transparent um, and trying to minimize any potential for corruption. And ultimately what we're interested in determining is what is the, effective, the effect of these incentive schemes on the toilet use. So by comparing the quantity of urine that we measured at the household before they had any incentive to produce more and the quantity of urine that they are producing during these incentive schemes, we can see what is the effect, were people motivated to produce more urine, um, and also to determine perhaps more importantly for EWS, if some of those toilets which had been locked, which had been out of use, which had been in disrepair, um, which basically we were measuring zero values at during that initial campaign, if people were motivated enough to put those toilets back into use and actually turn them into functioning toilets. And so if we could get um, measured values for those urine, that would be a great success. And the second slash first point again, um, which again will be very important for EWS and their policy development over time will be to determine if they want to continue this incentive scheme, how much would it cost for them and what would be the cost per liter of urine collected. So they can compare the different incentive schemes, compare the cost per liter, and although we can't really quantify the social benefit of having 100% sanitation, EWS can use that information and try and see if it's worth it for them to actually have these types of, of scenarios running to get an increased number of users um, making use of the toilets they have installed. 
We're also interested in comparing this incentive scheme to the EWS run collection, which I mentioned, and also comparing it to the fecal sludge collection, which is happening in the VIP areas. Um, both have pros and cons, and I know there's different people who lobby for both sides, so this will just be one more piece of information to feed into that debate. And finally, I just wanted to thank Teddy Gowden and everyone at EWS, um, Chris Buckley at PRG, Isabel Winter at ETH, the entire VUNA team, and certainly the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That's all, thank you.